Good morning. Good morning. All right. Just wanted to uh, welcome everybody here that are still trying to get in, and especially for those that are on uh, live stream, welcome to all of you. Wanted to open in prayer, and then we'll turn it over to Miss Kiki and Brother Bob, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our God. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together as a church family. And we welcome everyone here this morning, as well as those that are on live stream. Father, may you have your way in this service. May we glorify and honor you, as well as um, participate in, in communion later on in this service. We thank you for the opportunity to remember you this day. So we lift up every church in our community, our state, country, and world that are proclaiming you. May they proclaim you in boldness and in truth. And we turn our, our service our worship team, our pastor, over to you, and may you, whatever they say and do, may glorify you. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand with me and let's praise the Lord together. Let me hear you.
Oh, praise God. God is good, and there is power in the blood, and we're going to be singing about that next. And Thank you, Lord. Can I get you to clap with me? Thank you. That's awesome. From your burden of sin There's power in the blood Power in the blood Put over evil A victory win There's wonderful power In the blood Would you be wider Much wider than snow There's power in the blood Power in the blood Sin stains are lost In its life-giving Good morning, Antioch. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're so glad you're here. As always, we've got lots of great things ahead, events to join in on, as well as opportunities to serve. We'll be celebrating the Lord's table together this morning. So for those of you at home watching on live stream, please take a moment to gather your elements. For those of you joining us in person, you'll find individual communion sets at your chair. Antioch youth, you know, when part of the family is missing, the family is incomplete. And you teenagers are an important part of our family. Come on, admit it. Even you guys must be sick of living your whole life on a screen these days. So join us for church in person. It takes about 10 seconds to make a reservation. You'll find the link on Instagram, as well as our mobile app and website. But hey, let's be honest, Instagram's probably where you'll go. Pastor Herb is looking forward to meeting each of you. And he's pretty good with names, so we hope to see you soon and you can put him to the test. Keep in mind that next week our capacity will increase from 50 to 70 people per service, so there'll be plenty of room for everyone. For those of you unable to join us for church in person, please know that we are working diligently behind the scenes to improve our live stream production. Now there's a lot of moving parts involved, I won't bore you with the details, but suffice it to say, we've got a plan, we're addressing the challenges and implementing positive changes that you'll hopefully see soon. If anyone is interested in being part of the live stream ministry team, we'd love to have you. Contact Nancy for more information and Landon at abchurch.org. Just a reminder, the first Sunday of the month is Benevolent Sunday. 100% of your gifts to the Benevolence Fund goes to help families in need in our church and local community. Antioch, have a great week. Amen. Just wanted to um, let you know something regarding benevolence, as Melanie said in the, in the video. 
1% is used on behalf of people in our congregation and in the community. And yesterday I received a phone call from a family who lost their mother, but they did not have enough money to cremate her. And so the, the hospital would not release her until they, they were able to arrange, make those arrangements. So they, somebody in the community recommended that they call us. And so we took care of that for them. And that's on behalf of all of you who support us in benevolence. So amen on that. And um, for those of you who did not receive the information uh, last week, um, Alice Fry went home to be with the Lord. And so we wanted to just um, make sure that all of you were aware of that. They were a part of our church for so many years. And uh, I think they were married about 37 years, her, her and Ken. And so please lift up Ken Fry in prayer. Amen. Pastor Mark's going to try to go down this week, but because of the whole COVID thing, he's not allowed to physically visit with him. And so um, we're just trying to make arrangements so that Pastor Mark can go down there and be an encouragement to him. Amen. So this time in our, in our service, we're going to be lifting up our, our tithes and offerings to the Lord, and we um, thank all of you for the support that you've given throughout um, this whole pandemic. Your, your, your support has just been wonderful. For those of you who are visiting for the first time, are there any visitors here? If you can raise your hand. Hello? Hey, 253 in the house right there. All right, welcome. Mary Kay's um, cousin is here. We have, my wife and I, we have visitors here from Atlanta, the Fosters. So for those of you who are visiting for the first time, we ask that you not give because your presence here is your gift to us. So we thank you for being here. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we ask that you not give. God doesn't understand anything you think you can put in that offering. If it does not accompany your heart, it's not going to please him. If you're sitting here and you're a Christian and you have issues that, that, that's between you and the Lord, or relationally, you know you need to get right, we ask that you not give, because again, your heart must be right in order to please the Lord. And for the rest, your offerings have nothing to do with Antioch Bible Church. It has everything to do with your obedience to God. He's, he's blessed us in so many ways, and so we just ask that you pray, search your heart before you, you give an offering, and whatever you decide to give, may it be pleasing to God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being our God. Thank you for the opportunity to give back to you a small portion of that which you have given us. Father, whether um, here in person that want to give and, and, um, or online, we thank you, Lord, for the support that, that your family, our church family, has given throughout the, these last five or six months. Father, I pray that each person would examine their heart before you. May their offering be pleasing unto you. We cannot outgive you. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with. Forgive us of the times that we have not been good stewards of what you've blessed us with. But, Father, I pray that this offering uh, would honor you. Father, we thank you for our men and women that are serving in our military, in our fire department, the police men and women that are serving our communities, the first responders. Father, thank you for their sacrifice. Thank you for their service. May you bless and protect them. So again, Lord, may this offering be pleasing unto you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those of you who are here physically, you can either drop your offering on the way out or online. You can give on our website or our app. And again, for all, all of our family members that are on uh, live stream, thank you so much for being a part. So we're going to do uh, communion right now. And I just ask that each of us would examine our hearts before the Lord. Because self-examination is required in order for us to uh, partake of communion. 1 Corinthians uh, 11, verses 27 through 29 says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine him, herself, himself or herself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. There are many rituals that a lot of people go through throughout the years. Many churches have different customs re regarding uh, the Lord's Supper. Some, and in, in, I was part of, part of the Catholic faith a long time ago, and every single week they, they have communion. Other churches have it. You know, every other week, maybe some only once a quarter. 
But of course, here at Antioch, we believe it strongly in communion. And so we celebrate communion every first Sunday of the month. Our challenge to each and every one of you is centered upon this. Each of us must examine our hearts before the Lord so that we do not take communion unworthingly. The examination that we're asking is not meant to determine worthiness because none of us are worthy. It is meant to, for us to be careful in our reflections on the manner in which to take communion. The Lord's Supper is a holy meal. It's an opportunity for each of us to slow down in our lives to say, Lord, I remember. I remember all that you've done for us. This is what, what the benefit of, the, of communion is for us to take this time to say thank you, Lord, to be reminded, and then to, to realize that we have power in and through the blood. We have victory because of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. So the examination is for us to treat the Lord's Supper for what it is. It's a connecting point between us and Calvary. Amen? So as we take, again, each of us should examine our hearts before the Lord. In Luke 22, verses 14 through 20, the scripture says, and when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is a new covenant in my blood. So as we, as we partake, we're remembering Jesus' sacrifice and his broken body on our behalf and the blood that covers all of our sin. Take and eat, my friends. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the opportunity just to remember all that you've done for us. Father, I thank you for your sacrifice. I thank you for the victory you, you gave us on Calvary. Thank you for the reconciliation to our God. Father, may each of us continue to walk worthy of the manner in which the call that you have on our lives. Father, thank you for just slowing down enough on this Sunday to say we remember and we thank you. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Please forgive us for the times that we've dishonored that. Lord, may we be determined from this point on to continue to walk in a manner which honors you. Thank you for being our God, and thank you for this time together as a church family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to Antioch Bible Church. How's everyone doing? Hope you're excited this morning. If you are uh, watching on live stream, hello. I'm so excited that you are watching. Or if you are watching this later on, it's a recorded sermon. Thank you for joining in. Um, I have a praise report. In the first service, we had a man uh, give his life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Glory. The Bible says when one sinner repents, there is a party in heaven. I think they still might be jamming up there. Right about now. And, and I got a reminder uh, in my, one of my last sermons, I, I challenged uh, the congregation to share the gospel by Labor Day, to share the gospel with one person by Labor Day. And if you haven't done that yet, there's still one more day, amen, to share the gospel because we want to continue the party in heaven. Well, we are starting a brand new sermon series today. The sermon series is called Classic, and we will be walking through the book of James. So if you have your Bible or if you have a device, go ahead and go to the book of James. Now, when I think of the word classic, the first thing that comes to my mind is a classic automobile. An older Thunderbird, a Mustang, a Corvette, those are classic automobiles. And although a classic automobile was built many years ago, it will still turn your head as it rolls down the highway on a sunny day. The book of James is a classic. Chronologically, it's the first book that was written in the New Testament. And its practical advice is still relevant today. In just five short chapters, you will find timeless truths to help you in your everyday life. If you want to know how to be a Christian, James is the book for you. So for the next 12 weeks, we will walk through the book of James verse by verse. Now, James was a popular name in the Bible. There were at least four men in the New Testament with the name James. And ancient historians of the church and modern scholars believe that it was James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote this book. And initially, James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. But once James saw his big brother rise from the dead, he changed his mind. James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. So as we open up the book of James, the first theme that arises is the fitting topic of trials. And it's fair to say that all of us are facing trials today. The coronavirus pandemic has changed our lives. This is certainly a test of our faith. The racial unrest in America is a trial. The presidential election will be a test of how we treat other people who have different views. 
But whatever your trial may be, I believe that God's word will encourage you today. The theme of the message today is rejoice in the valley. And James is going to help us rejoice in the valley of trial. Let's take a look at James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. And the self-identification of James is very humble. He could have said, James, the brother of Jesus, or James, the leader of the very first church. But he says, James, a servant of God. How do you identify yourself? What do you want attached to your name? A servant of God. And the recipients of the letter are the 12 tribes in the dispersion. These are the 12 tribes of Israel who are dispersed or scattered among Gentile nations. Due to religious persecution, Christians were forced to leave their home. And leaving their home and everything they knew was a trial. They no longer had access to the synagogue. They were split up from their family and friends. They were struggling spiritually. They were poor, lacking possessions. And James writes this letter to shepherd these Jewish Christians in their everyday faith. The word greetings, I don't want you to pass by that. Because that word in the original languages means Cairo. And Cairo literally means to rejoice. So James begins his letter with a joyful salutation to Christians stuck in the valley. How could they be joyful given their circumstance? How can you be joyful in the trial that you are facing. Let's read verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Joy is a choice. We choose to have joy. Jesus considered the cross as the joy that was set before him. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And I have recently been wrestling with this question. How do I have joy in the midst of my trials? In the midst of my difficult circumstances, how do I not only get through and endure, but how do I have joy and a positive attitude while I'm facing intense pressure? I have a friend who exudes a joyful spirit. And I went to see him. And I said, how do you maintain joy during trials? He looked at me without hesitation. And he said, be grateful for what God has already done. Be grateful for what God has already done. So I'm a reflective type of person, and I wrote down a list of 20 things 
that I'm grateful for. And the first thing that I'm grateful for is that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. If you have salvation, do you realize that you are one of the few who have eternal life? You are in the small minority of those walking down the narrow road that leads to life? If you have salvation, you can have joy. You can be grateful because you know that there are many who are going by the wide road that leads to destruction. And so as I wrote down 20 things that I'm grateful for, it gave me perspective. And maybe that's something that you need to reflect on, what you're grateful for, because perspective is key to maintaining joy. I recall talking to my father, and I was complaining about my situation. And I'll never forget what he told me. He said, son, it could be a lot worse. Perspective is key to maintaining joy. So I have a few questions for you to wrestle with. What are you grateful for today? What has God already done in your life? And are you struggling to maintain joy because of a lack of perspective? As we look at verse 2, we see the word trials of various kinds. And in this context, a trial is a test from God. And notice that James says, when you meet trials of various kinds. He doesn't say, if you meet trials of various kinds. So one thing that we all have in common is we will meet trials of various kinds. There is an immediate purpose of your trial and there is a final purpose of your trial. In verse 3, you see the immediate purpose, which is steadfastness. That's what it's translated in the ESV version. But in, in your version, it may say patience or endurance or perseverance. The Greek word literally means to abide under. And the testing of our faith gives us an immediate opportunity to abide under God. And the final purpose of the trial is found in verse 4, that we may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, that we may be spiritually mature in Christ. Without pain and without suffering, we are not able to identify with the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. The esteemed pastor and theologian Charles Swindoll said it very well. The people I would regard as having great Christian character are invariably people who have learned to handle life in the crucible. It's the mother who lost a child and is able to say to God, you gave and you took away. Blessed be your name. It's the father who having given his best at the firm for years, loses his job and says to his family, Let's get together tonight and thank God for this opportunity to trust him. It's the teenager 
who says, I won't surrender my principles. I'll maintain my standards even though I'm shunned and treated like an outsider by my peers. Church, God's spiritual growth plan for you happens through trials. And this is what God revealed to me that really touched me, is that God is way more interested in developing our character than he is in our comfort. So if you value your comfort more than your character, trials will frustrate you and upset you. And God builds our character prior to putting us into service for his kingdom. The trials that you're going through are being used to prepare you for what God has for you. He's developing your character so you can serve him in such a way that brings him glory. Job said it well in Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job said, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Trials are an opportunity to grow closer to God and to develop our character. And to maintain joy, we must rely on God's wisdom. Let's look at verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Wisdom is a supernatural gift from God. It's associated with the presence of God and the spirit of God. Why do we need wisdom during trials? We need wisdom so we don't waste the opportunity to grow in our faith. We pray for our brothers and sisters as they face difficult circumstances in our lives. That God would take those circumstances away. But we should pray for our brothers and sisters that they would have the wisdom to not forfeit the development of their character. God gives generously without reproach which means that he doesn't hold our failures against us. I'm so thankful for that because I've failed so many times as I face trials. But when I repent from my sins and get back up, God is ready to accept my prayer of faith. And we get tossed around in trials because we lack faith. And so, but when we pray for wisdom, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit will lead you to act. And I'm going to share something that could be interpreted as somewhat controversial. So I ask the Lord for humility and wisdom. I ask for your grace as I share the racial tension in America has tested my faith. And I've been praying for wisdom. See, I have always been passionate for the gospel. 
but I have avoided issues that are political. And so I have been asking the Lord to develop me as a leader. And here's the bottom line. Everything else aside, I want to love what God loves. We should all want to love what God loves. And I know, and you likely know from reading the scriptures, that God loves justice. Psalms chapter 33, verse 5. It says that he loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Let me explain it like this. I love the game of basketball. I will always love the game of basketball. That will never change. And in the game of basketball, most people have a dominant hand. And I'm right-handed. So I'll dribble with my right hand. And I'll shoot with my right hand. And the natural way for me to do a layup is with my right hand. But as you play the game of basketball, you have to use both hands. You can't just use your right hand because your right hand will be taken away. So you got to use your left hand. You have to be able to dribble with your left hand. Sometimes you want to shoot with your right, but you have to shoot with your left hand. You may have to lay the ball up with your left hand. And so my right hand of righteousness is strong. It's my dominant hand. I can shoot. I can do a layup. That's strong. But my left hand of justice is not strong. But I need to develop my left hand. I need to be able to dribble with confidence with my left hand. I need to be able to shoot. I need to be able to do a layup with both hands. So the time is now for evangelical Christians to not only use their right hand of righteousness, what they're comfortable with, but it's time to develop the left hand of justice. And as the Lord is developing my left hand to make me more spiritually mature, to make me love what he loves, he has given me wisdom as I ask in faith. And as a leader in the church, I need wisdom to lead Antioch towards racial reconciliation. The elder board has put together a racial reconciliation survey that we will send out this week because we want to hear the heart and thoughts of our people. And the results of this survey will help us take the next steps towards racial reconciliation. Black Lives Matter was a biblical statement before it was a political statement. In the very first chapter of the Bible, God made it clear that all people are made in the image of God. In the book of Exodus, God appointed Moses to free the Israelites from shadow slavery, which is detestable to God. Our Jewish Messiah died for Gentiles. That's blacks and whites. 
Simon of Cyrene, a black man from northern Africa, was given the honor to carry the cross for Jesus. Please ask God for wisdom during this time of racial tension and pray that our church would not only love righteousness, but that we would also love justice because we want to love what God loves. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. This is what it says. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. God will give generous amounts of wisdom as we face trials. And when the trials of this life come to an end, we will receive the ultimate reward in heaven. Let's read verses 9 through 12. It says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat, and withers the grass, its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Money and beauty are perhaps the two most desirable characteristics this world offers. But James reminds us that both money and beauty, or the lack thereof, is fleeting. We see the language in verse 10, pass away. In verse 11, we see fade away. And then blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. So remember the greeting of joy. And then in verse 2, James says, count it all joy. And then when we get to verse 12, he says, blessed, which literally is translated genuine joy. And James echoes the teachings of his big brother, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12, it says this, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In the first century, a winning athlete would receive a crown at the end of the race we will receive a victor's garland as we finish the race of life. The crown of life is a symbol of our great reward in heaven. Our salvation was the joy set before him as he endured the cross. And love will always be the foundation of victory. As you look in verse 12, It says, which God has promised to those who love him. 
You might think it would say to those who trust him or to those who obey him. But no, the crown of life is promised to those who love him. Love is the foundation of our victory. Church, I hope you are encouraged today to rejoice in the valley. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, O oh Lord, we thank you for your word. O oh Lord, thank you for encouraging us with your word today. Lord, we must have this joy that James speaks about. Lord, Father, give us joy as we go through the trials of life. Lord, as people leave today, help them remember that there is a purpose to our trials, to abide in you and to grow in you. And Lord, as your people face trials, Lord, let us get on our knees and ask for wisdom. Lord, we need wisdom. Lord, we don't want to waste this opportunity to grow. And Lord, you have given us an opportunity. Lord, let us face our trials with the wisdom that you give us from your word and in prayer. And Lord, we thank you for the crown of life that you promise to all who love you. And Lord, it's because you first loved us. Lord, we have such a great victory awaiting as we cross the finish line. Lord, help us to run our race with endurance. Help us to consider our Savior who endured the cross that was the joy set before him. And with everyone's head bowed and eyes closed and even on live stream, if you have never told God that you love him, if you have never surrendered your life to him, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Like I said, there was one man who gave his life to Jesus Christ in our first service. Maybe there's someone here right now that wants to call out to the Lord and say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Lord, Father, today I want to give my life to you. Today, I want to have the crown of life. I want to have the promise of heaven. Just because you go to church or watch a church service, that does not make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you need to do that, just call out to the Lord right now. Surrender your life to Him. Tell Him that you're sorry. And ask Him for wisdom and help to grow in Christ. If you made that decision today, I want to assure you that today is the best day of your life. And with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you made that decision, just raise your hand right where you are so I can see it. If it's the first time that you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, I just want to know. I just want to rejoice with you, and I want to help you grow in your faith. 
If you're on live stream and this is your first time, go ahead and raise your hand right where you are. And I see your hand, young man, right there. Hallelujah. We praise God for that faith. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation. Not only saving someone in the first service, but saving someone in the second service. Oh, I believe there's a party in heaven right now. I believe there's a party in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Is there anyone else besides that young man who wants to give their life to Jesus Christ today for the very first time? I'm not asking if you are already a believer in Christ. I'm asking if you want to repent of your sins for the very first time. Is there anyone on live stream? If you're on live stream and you're raising your hand, I am so excited for you. It's the most important decision you can ever make. And what I want you to do is contact our church office. Email us info at abchurch.org and tell us about the decision that you made. Lord, Father, we are so thankful for the two people in our presence today that gave their life to you. Lord, we know that only you can save. And Lord, we rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Oh, God is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Oh, Antioch, it looks like we're going to have a baptism soon. And I am so excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining us on live stream. And we look forward to having you next Sunday on live stream or here in person. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful day.